Hey again, everybody. It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show, recorded live every Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at the Ann Arbor District Library on the corner of 5th and William in lovely Ann Arbor, Michigan. Streamed live on comicsaregreat.tv. I'm Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist. And with me today, well, I should say, we're, here's the tease. We're going to talk about visual storytelling. We're going to get really deep and nerdy into uh, the process of making comic stories. And uh, I combed the internet for some of the best people in the world to talk about this subject. Uh, and I came up with uh, Jake Parker of Agent44.com. Hello. Hey. All you could find was me. And, uh... <laughs> I, 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 I sifted the pan, and all that was left was Jake Parker. And then uh, to his left on the screen is uh, returning for the last time for a few weeks, uh, Dave Roman of Yaytime.com. Hey, Dave. Uh, thanks for having me back. Thanks for being back. Uh, Hi, Dave. <laughs> hey, Jake. Good to see you again. So um, uh, listeners need to uh, help me out with this in uh, making sure that Dave uh, feels welcome here. If you like seeing Dave on the show, or Jake for that matter, <laughs> uh, you can email the show at comicsaregreat at gmail.com and just say, more Jake, more Dave. And then I will have some, something, some ammunition when I approach these guys and harangue them with emails saying, please be on my show and take time out of your day to talk about this stuff. Uh, I'll say this again at the end because I think after what you hear from these guys, you're going to want them back. But uh, before we go any further with the, the general topic, we got to talk about some stuff that you guys have been working on. Uh, let's start with Jake. Yeah, you, you have a very exciting project to to show off, and that people should go out and buy, right? Yes, yes. Let me uh, let me grab it here. Um, so I this is my first picture book. It's called The Astonishing Secret of Awesome Man, illustrated by myself and written by some guy, uh, Michael Shabon. Uh, Michael Shabon. That name does not ring a bell. I don't know. Is he, is he some new up and comer? Yeah, yeah. You should check out some of his other stuff. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> Didn't he win the Pulitzer for? Yeah, he won the Pulitzer. Uh, yeah, for uh, uh, Cavalier and Clay, I believe it was. Anyway, so this is this is my first illustrated book, and it is about this character, Awesome Man, and it's just full of, you know, full page illustrations. Um, Super cool. See. Photoshop paintings, eh? Uh, it's a, it's a mix. It's a digital traditional mix. So, oh. but uh, I tried to keep it bright and colorful, and um, and fun. So, how, how does that work when you? See, I'm I'm not done a children's book before. How does that work when you work with an author? Uh, do they give you a script and then you just uh, give them a bunch of sketches based on the script and it goes through a revision process or what? Uh, yeah, basically, um, uh, you you know you're approached by whoever uh, the publisher and editor there and they, they send you the um, the script for the for the for the book uh, you read through it and and basically um, you just have uh, you have a go at it sometimes uh, an editor might have ideas of what the illustration what an illustration on this page should be maybe the author has some input but usually all the visuals are left to the artist, which which is quite nice. Oh, for sure. I bet that's super rewarding to actually have that kind of uh, creative freedom on a project. Yeah, yeah, and 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 you try to make illustrations that tell the rest of the story, so uh, the words aren't repeating exactly what's happening on the page. So, yeah, suddenly, uh, awesome man blasts into the room, and then he blasts in the room, and then says, "Hey, I'm blasting into the room, everybody." <laughs> yeah, like that. The the hard part though on this one is, uh, you know. Uh, let me. I'll read a panel, a page, a panel. I'll read a page. Uh, so, let's see here. Um, let's find a good example here. Um, uh, that's a good one. So <laughs> it says. To disconnect. <laughs> What's that? I said this would be a good time for me to disconnect. <laughs> He says, I can fly as high as a satellite and as straight as an arrow or through the time barrier and not get dizzy or feel nauseous or smash into things except on purpose. When you are a superhero like me, sometimes you have to smash into things, right? So that's a, a mouthful. What do you illustrate for those words? You know, what images do you, you know, which ones do you pick out? So I ended up doing, you know, you can see on this page, fly as high as a satellite, straight as an arrow. That was a little bit difficult. How do you draw him straight as an arrow, so I kind of had the cape look like a pointed arrow. Yeah. And then, how do you draw him flying through the time barrier? 
you know, that this was my solution. I'm sure a better artist could do <laughs> something else, but actually, I need to be fair. This was my wife's solution. She said, why don't you just have, <laughs> have them one side dinosaurs, one side, you know, city, and there's, you know, this thing that he's bursting through. And I was like, genius, I'm doing it. <laughs> How many times have we done that? Let's pull the room. How many times have we turned to our wives? Well, <laughs> And, and, and Dave's in a special place because his wife is an Eisner winning cartoonist. So I'm sure you defer to her on a lot of things like this. But I mean, that's, that's where. That's the end of every argument in their home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's terrible. <laughs> Tell me that I need so, Dave. <laughs> Although, if you're going to stack awards next to each other, I have, an, I, I have an Ignatz, and an Ignatz is like a brick. So a brick can crush an Eisner if it's rock. Oh, paper rock scissors. There you go. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, uh, Jared, um, one of my most popular characters I ever created, the Abominable Snowman, eh, and kind of created him. She doodled him on a page for me to cheer me up one time, and I was bummed out about a deadline, and I turned him into a character, and she loves to remind me of that. That's so. great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my wife loves to remind me, too, <laughs> of her things as well. So, um, you know... You're no slouch, uh, and, and uh, Jake, uh, in terms of working, you've, you've been in the flight anthologies, you've been, mm -hmm. you did Missile Mouse, Flight Explorer, um, a lot of neat stuff at agent44.com, and you teach, too, which we'll talk more about some classes that are coming up that you're teaching, right? right? Uh, uh, don't forget uh, this little thing, too. <laughs> yep, Missile Mouse. Missile yeah. Mouse. Uh, that, that came out this year as well, so, you know, it's... it's uh, uh, look, and even... Hey, Dave look at that. <laughs> I believe I, still gotta get book <laughs> I believe it is in the Ann Arbor District Library collection. So anybody who's watching from the Ann Arbor area can check it out today. And you won't be sorry uh, whether you are a young person or young at heart. I think it's it's really worth reading. And if you're one of those nerds like me who loves Richard Scarry books, where you get all these cutaways of buildings and things to see how all the plumbing works in busy town, uh, there's lots of that in Missile Mouse, right? Yep, there is. And I'm a nerd like you because I love <laughs> stuff. <laughs> I love Richard Scarry. He's a, he's a big influence. Oh, yeah, me too. Uh, yeah, one of the greatest cartoon, or cartoonist storytellers of all time. So, uh, Dave, I want to turn to you and make some noise about something that uh, we haven't talked about before. Nursery Rhyme Comics, 50 timeless rhymes from 50 celebrated cartoonists from first, second publishing. Do you have it? Do all right. You, for the people watching, you can see the cover, which is drawn by Vera Brosgall. Uh, it's got Humpty Dumpty reading a comic book about the fall over from laughing so hard at the comic book. Oh, no. Oh, oh wow. So we, we <laughs> should walk, say walk <laughs> 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 we should say that these aren't straight up uh, visual interpretations of the nursery rhymes. You all have interpreted them in some interesting ways. I want, do you want to talk about your piece in the book? Um, sure. Some of them actually are kind of straightforward. Uh, or faithful adaptations. They, these are not uh, sarcastic uh, parodies or anything. They, they are loving interpretations. Uh, but as far as like time periods and stuff like mine is uh, one, two, buckle your shoe, uh, which if you actually read makes little to no sense whatsoever. <laughs> um, so I think uh, I could pretty much go whichever direction I wanted with it. Um, but for me, one, two, uh, sort of refer to it, these little clone characters, uh, which you can't really see, but you should go online. You can Google it. I think uh, you can find it on the Internet. And the book comes out in the fall. Um, but mine's got this sort of like science fiction, uh, almost Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory whimsy to that it. That looks great. That looks really great. <laughs> Um, and this book is like just filled with amazing, amazing uh, artists uh, from both children's books and comics. Uh, Did you, like was that out at Comic Con? Uh, they last... had a preview of it at the first second booth, okay. but the book does not actually come out until the fall. All right. Um, and it's really worth looking up. I think this book is going to be the most popular graphic novel ever for grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a good tagline. <laughs> you know, well, usually it's, it's, it's the other way around, right? It's usually they say, like, this ain't your daddy's blah, 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 you know? But, like, this right. is your grandparents' comic. <laughs> no, I mean, I, 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 what I mean more is, like, it's going to be a great gift. I think this is going to yeah. be, you know, the kind of book that, uh, parents will want to read with their kids, and then kids will want to read it themselves, and then want to make their own comics based on nursery rhymes. I'm I'm really excited about, uh, you know, the reaction that this may get. Me too. I can't wait to read and it. And hats off to Chris Duffy, who was the editor on this. Uh, Chris was my boss at Nickelodeon Magazine for many years, so 
he was the perfect person to assemble a project like this. Oh. And for Second Publishing, another example of how virtually everything they're doing is incredible. Like, just once again, you know, I said it before, I say it again, they're proving to be the Pixar of the comics industry right now. It's like everything I see that comes out, I'm like, well, I want to read every single piece, whereas that's not the case with every comics publisher, right? Yeah, pretty much everything except American Born Chinese, I think, is uh, good. <laughs> 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 well, there goes my opportunity to get Gene Yang the on the show. What? <laughs> they dropped the ball on that one. I yeah, know. I know that thing was a real, real stinker. Yeah, no, no, nobody like like that one. But um, <laughs> okay, well, let's talk about visual storytelling, shall we? We haven't done a really deep, nerdy discussion on uh, how this stuff works and how we all do it. And you know, I teach a lot of classes in the Ann Arbor area. And uh, as a matter of fact, I'm finishing up this week and next week are the last two weeks of my comics fundamentals class, which is every Wednesday at the Pittsfield branch from I think six to eight p.m. And uh, one of the, the recurring questions that I get from stu uh, my adult students is, how do you break down a story visually? How do you decide what scene comes after which scene? Uh, what, what's, what's your process? Do you go from a script do you, to, to sketches to the final page? Do you just jump into the final page? Uh, and you know, the tough part about that question is there's no one way to do it, right? And that's why I think this is great getting three guys together who all have probably have very different strategies and pro uh, processes uh, in doing this kind of thing. Um, to, to, to demonstrate that, because it's really tough when you're a teacher in that room, you can say, well, here's how I do it, and here's how I think some other people do it, <laughs> but, but, you know, right. and here's what some people have reported on doing, but really demonstrating for them that there is no one right way to do it, and sort of comparing and contrasting our different styles of doing this thing. Um, so, writing, you know, who wants to go first? Who wants to go first in describing their process of writing a story as best they can? You know, I mean, I'm asking a big question here, like, what's your philosophy of life, practically? But <laughs> as best you can, succinctly, like, really kind of summarize your, your uh, strategy into taking an idea and turning it into a finished comic book story. Okay. Well, I, I've got the, that presentation that, that uh, I share with uh, classes. I could, uh, we could just go over right now if you want. Sure. Does that sound good? Yeah. Let yeah. me uh, let me just move my my camera here. I'm gonna I got my little tripod set up so it doesn't get all wiggly. But oh, uh, fancy. Don't get seasick now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Okay. Uh, let me just line this up. <laughs> Look at this. How I make a graphic it, novel. It looks like he's gonna run a film strip. It's awesome. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I'm waiting for the boop noise. <laughs> 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 Dave, you could be the AV guy. You could turn the film. <laughs> Making a graphic novel. So, Jimmy wants to make a graphic novel. <laughs> the, the, uh, <laughs> so let me let me just say real quick um, for the audio podcast, you're going to want to watch the video for this. Uh, we're going to do our best to describe what we're seeing as we go, but and then Jake's going to be narrating this, of course. But obviously, the richer experience is going to be on the video after the fact. But hit it, Jake. Okay, well, this is just a presentation I, I give to uh, writing classes. So these are, these are, I'm coming at it as people who may not have drawn a comic yet or, or maybe have drawn a comic, but they just want to know what, what my process is. Uh, so there's some stuff to, that we kind of go over at the beginning where I, I, I make sure we're all on the same page, right? So graphic novel definition, it's a novel in the form of a comic strip. Uh, so... The way I see that, it's a story that decided to tell itself with pictures, uh, words, and symbols, you know, instead of just straight up uh, prose. Um, so there's a reason you're telling your story in graphics novels form, because maybe you're a visual person, and or maybe there's some things that you want to say with, uh, with pictures that you can't quite say with words. So prime example of a, of a comic, Calvin Hobbes, and here we have each of those three things. We have uh, pictures, we have words uh, in the form of dialogue and also in the form of sound effects, bonk, whap, oof, boop, uh, and then we have symbols. So your word balloons, your panels, um, and then you know these little whip de doos and, and sparks that represent pain and, and speed and movement. Uh, and so those those are your, those are the the comic artist's tools that he has in his in his in his toolbox to to create these stories. All right. So uh, let's get down to it, shall we? Uh, 
I have two graphic novels. We talked about them already. Missile Mouse. Uh, uh, this is pretty much how I make them. Um, let me just skip through this stuff. I came up with Missile Mouse back in 1992, and you can kind of see the evolution of the character here. Uh, I'll go back to that really quick. So, you know, he started out of this, you know, original, actually, here's the original drawing uh, that I did here. I think I was 14 years old, and it was just a combination of, of all my, uh, uh, the things I loved, Rocketeer, Spaceman Spiff, Chippendale, throwing them all together into, into one thing. So, so this is character design, I think, in its purest form, <laughs> or almost a childlike form. What do you love? Let's put it all together in one character. Mm -hmm. And as he evolved through the years. So as I got more into, uh, you know, superhero comics, he became more like a superhero. And as I got more into, uh, you know, other, other kinds of things, and, you know, he, he, he went through all these stages. And this is where he's at now. Um, okay, writing. Um, main questions when I am writing down uh, this story, when I'm figuring out this thing, is I'm trying to define the world. And I don't know if this is how you guys work, but I do, I like to create the world first. Um, and then from that, I'll s figure out who my characters are. Maybe I'll start with the character like Missile Mouse, but, but definitely world building is a part of this process because this character has to exist in a world. And I, and I like understanding uh, you know, the, the past, what happened before this character, what's going on in this world that this character inhabits, and what's going to happen in the future, and what, what is this character going to do that affects the future of this world. And, of course, with that, I try to figure out what the conflict for this character is, and what are this character's desires. And I try to do that with each of the characters that I come up with. Uh, so here we have a page of my notes, writing notes. Um, this, you can see... Missile Mouse Backstory is the title there, October 2007. So uh, for several years, I just kind of jotted down notes from time to time and figured out, uh, and this is just a thought comes into my head, let's write it down. You can see these questions here. What does a character want? What does he think he wants? What does he actually need? These are the questions I'm asking myself. Uh, you know, and then I try to answer those questions. Missile Mouse wants to find out about his past. What's keeping him from doing this? So it's always you know, second guessing what I write down and trying to figure out. So you write it out as kind of like a conversation with yourself? Yeah, you could say that. It's kind of, kind of like a conversation with myself. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's just free form kind of uh, putting these thoughts down on paper, not exactly thinking of the full story yet, story structure or anything like that, but just, just getting all these ideas down. Um, you know, this is a, a, a just a random page of uh, some of the other characters, the, the secondary characters, Ulrich, Hyde, Maxwell. It's kind of hard to read on the screen, but what, what, are, what are these bullet-pointed lists that you got there? So it says here, Missile Mouse trusting Ulrich. Push the, push the dynamic between Ulrich. Uh, you hide. And Missile Mouse gains trust by breaking the rules. Maybe they poke fun at Ulrich. So I'm just I'm throwing down these kinds of things. Maxwell demotes him from single-person missions. But at the end, Missile Mouse is in the same status he was as he started. So there's kind of an equilibrium there. These are the kind of things I'm... I'm so you're, you're kind of like spitballing potential plot moments in the story, yeah. followed by sub-moments of notes to yourself on how to play it. Right. Here's another note, like beef up character relationships. I'm realizing, you know, I need to have these guys working together. And how can I really show that, that these, these guys are you know, in the same world together and, and, and experiencing each other? Here's an interesting thing too. This is a timeline, uh, and it starts. You know, here's where. <laughs> wow. <laughs> this is where it exists, and I'm figuring out what happened. You know, a thousand years prior. What's going on? Uh, you know, after afterwards, I have notes down here, and so you know, I have hyperspace tunnels discovered. This is the first contact between two planets. The age of expansion, where all the planets expanded out to to the rest of the world. Hey, my, my daughter's really name excited. is. <laughs> that? I'm just like watching Jersey's face like light up. <laughs> the age of expansion. <laughs> uh, then there's the division of powers, and that's when the creation of the evil empire happened. But then there's an alliance to to counteract that, and then the Great War, 
And this is when artificial black holes were devices were invented, and they were the, the main tool of this war, kind of the equivalent of nuclear nuclear bombs, right? Uh, so that's, you know, right around here is where half the galaxy was destroyed, the the evil empire was put to rest, the new alliance was created, the the um, missile mouse's secret agency was was established here, and then the stuff that missile mouse deals with in, in Star Crusher is all things that happened, you know, back in here, and this is why they happened. So none of this wow. really ends up in the story, but I have to know it if I want my story to, to be believable. So let me describe this for the people listening after the fact. What we're looking at is literally a timeline with all these drop-downs from the different points in the timeline with notes on what events are happening, all the events that Jake was describing. Plus, there's a paragraph of notes more on this world building that's going on underneath the timeline, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's basically it. Um, and, and, you know, this, this comes from my love of the Star Wars universe and how, you know, thought out that thing is. I guess if you could say it's thought out, but it's, it's, it's very broad and, and expansive, and, and I like to add that to some of the things I do. So once all this stuff is kind of floating around, then I sit down and I try to figure out what, what this actual story is going to be, uh, also known as I make the outline. And so I sit down and I write, okay, uh, right here's the intro, act one. These are the things I want to set up. Um, more notes, and you can see I'll write something and then I'll decide, okay, wait, I want this to happen up in between here. Uh, maybe this section should go down here. And I like writing on paper because I can do this and I can go back. Uh, I'm not tempted to delete something I don't like. I just leave it on the page and then I can go back and maybe, maybe there's something to it. And I can and can move it forward into another section of the story. So I like I like to write write down. So uh, you're you're just typing out on the computer just like a bunch of paragraphs on this is what essentially happens in Act One, and then you <clears> write <throat> another paragraph that's like a sort of like a more detailed approach. But then you, after the fact, you'll go in with like a pen and just like. So this is this is actually writing. I, I write this out. I don't I don't I don't type quite yet. Oh, this is all handwritten. It's kind of hard to see on the screen. So this is all handwritten stuff, and then like. Yeah, this is hand Okay, and then you'll go and you'll circle areas and move them around with arrows to say, move this piece here, move this piece here. So it's really, you're not editing yourself as you go. You're editing after the fact. Is that right? Uh, it's, it's both. I'll edit as I go, and I'll edit after the fact. Uh, this is another thing, too. Like, you can see over here, there's Missile Mouse with a helmet on. And that's because in the story I'm writing that he has to go out into space. And then the artist in me is like, oh, well, I have to draw what he looks like in space he can't just be helmetless in space what 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 does missile mouse's helmet look like i haven't solved that design problem yet so i'll i'll kind of get on this little rabbit trail here and and, and and draw out some stuff there um so here's just the the finished sort of written version written version of it uh all three or all three acts all the structure and then i'll go to the typed version i'll take those notes I'll wow. go to the type versions because this is, you know, my editor doesn't want to read my notes. <laughs> you know, she wants to see, he or she wants to, uh, to, to read it, you know, typed, and that way they can make good, clean notes and, and understand it. So you have to write a, like, almost a, a prose synopsis of the graphic novel when you're dealing mm -hmm. with your editors. So. Yeah, and that's just so they know what, what the story is. Uh, and if there's any major problems in it, I don't have to redraw anything. We can just kind of be up front and be like, this is, this is, this is what I'm going to draw, and is it working or not? And at Scholastic, the, the editors that I've worked with, they're, they're big about having me tell the story that, that I want to tell and, not, and making sure that I'm doing it to the best of my abilities. So they're not trying to change things, and they're not saying, oh, Missile Mouse needs to be nicer. You've got too gruff of a character here. They want, uh, they understand that that's the character, and and they're going to help me uh, make him come across that way. So, in other words, their job is to figure out what you want to say, and mm -hmm. then and evaluate whether or not you're actually saying what you exactly. intend to say. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So, at this stage, once it's all written out, then I'll start start thumb thumbnailing it out, and I'll I'll figure out the actual script. And these, this is a full eight and a half by eleven sheet, and I break it down. Um, to nine page spreads, and I'll go in and just draw really tiny. Uh, they're almost stick figures. And the little word balloons, I don't know if you could tell, but I put a number in each word balloon. And then um, I will have another sheet 
where I write down what the words are in that word balloon with the number next to it. The reason I work at this such a small scale is because it's quick. Uh, I can get the, the stuff down, and I know that if it works tiny like this, if the story's reading well like this, it's definitely going to work when I draw it on 11 by 17 sheet of paper, right? Uh, and plus, if I need to fix anything, it's it's painless to just cross a tiny thumbnail out and draw, you know, another page. You haven't invested much time in it, right? Right. And and then this also serves as what they call the squint test, right? Do you guys do that? Where you, yeah. You squint at the page to see if it reads that when it's all blurry like that. But anyway, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so this is just a sheet of my my dialogue with the numbers associated. So you know. Bubble 23, it says, all right, you two, enough chit-chat. Here's our mission, you know. Uh, this is an interesting page. So in Missile Mouse, the Star Crusher, he, um, he has to go in and save Ulrich the scientist who is being interrogated in the basement of this factory. Uh, and I couldn't quite wrap my head around how does he get from the spaceship down to the factory and what kind of peril and excitement happens and what happens when he he gets out so I had to draw it out pretty linearly right so Missile Mouse jumps out here he ignites his jetpack he flies over uh, and he fights these guys at this time he also sets up his drill bomb at the top of the building and then he comes down in the, to the tunnel down to the lab where they are once he's down there he ignites the drill bomb which uh, blows a hole all the way through to the bottom and then he can rocket his way back out and that's how they escape. And once I've drawn it onto the paper, you know, this way, when I sit down to thumbnail out the, the story moments, you know, on, on, uh, in sequentially, I have a better idea of what the action is actually happening that's taking place. Wow. I love how this is, and what we're looking at is like, uh, for, again, for the podcast, people listening to the audio after the fact, we're looking at a bunch of cutaways and sort of like diagrams. What's that, Dave? They look like blueprints. Yeah, it looks like blueprints of where the story is going to take place and what, the, like, following the path. This is like the family circus following Billy through the town. It's like, here's all the places <laughs> that Missile Moss is going to go in this story. I love how this is a combination of a lot of writing, handwriting something out, but then also switching to doodles to, to uh, you know, f f suss out the story, right? And, and again, I think that's the, uh, you know, that's, that's maybe the, the, the curse, but also the blessing of being visual storytellers is is you, you have to figure out these things visually, but I think in the end it also makes for a richer storytelling experience yeah. as well. So, uh, so this is the actual art stage. Um, these, now we're in book two. Uh, so here I have my thumbnails. Uh, then I go to the rough, the rough page. And how, this, how big is the rough page? Uh, well, I switched, switched up my... I was roughing them out uh, at size, this print size. So it was six by nine, but I switched to, to book two to a different process. I got a Cintiq and I actually roughed this out on the Cintiq. Uh, and so uh, this is all digital. And the reason I, I went that route is because at this stage I can already load in the type and I can draw a bubble around the type and know exactly how much space I need for the type. Because uh, I was finding in book one, I would, I would sketch out the page you know, on, on a separate sheet of paper and I'd write with my own handwriting in, you know, the words, but was it the right size and did I leave enough room? And I found that I had yeah. some problems where my bubbles were either too big or too small. So at this stage, you know, I'm, I'm able to get the, the right size bubble for the amount of words. Um, I'll, then I'll print this out. I'll print out the sheet and I'll draw over Lightbox and draw over it. And you could see here the inking and you, maybe you can tell there's some red pencil underneath where I've figured out some of the details a little bit better. Um, and then this is cleaned up line work. Um, and then I'll go into uh, the flatting stage. And usually I'll, I'll hand off flats to an assistant and they'll just lay in the flat color. And then when I get it back from them, I'll go in and add shadow and highlight. And then uh, um, the next stage will be all the, the little effects and the glows and and um, you know, coloring in the letters and things like that, and that's pretty much start to finish how I make a page, and uh, pretty much you then repeat that <laughs> 150 times. Yeah, repeat 150 times. That's the best slide <laughs> in the whole presentation. <laughs> and you know, that's 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 my process, start to finish. Um, yeah. 
I don't know if it's what you guys do or if there's similarities or, or, or some different things, but let's kick it over. Well, let's kick it over to Dave and see what, what, what's different and what's the same. Uh, gosh, that's a great presentation, Jake. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, no. so Dave, how, what, what's, what's your method? Is, is it that, uh, that, that, uh, detailed and engineering, uh, style? I think so. Most, most cartoonists that I've talked to work on some, work in some variation of those stages. Um, but nowadays, because everything's digital or everything ends up digital, how you sort of get there doesn't seem to matter as much as it used to. When I was starting in comics, I went to school of visual arts and they would give you like blue line pro pages and they'd be like, this is the size of a comic page and everybody yeah. has to get that size. And these are sort of the stages because this is what it takes to produce a, a nicely printed book because printing technology was only at a certain place. Um, and things had to be separated, you know by hand, I guess. <laughs> the, which, is a, which is a liberation, but at the same time, it also can be crippling because now you have virtually infinite choices in terms of page format. You want it to be wide, you want it to be tall, you know, that is really open to you now, whereas 20 years ago, it was a di di totally different story, right? Right, yeah. I mean, the only thing you really need to be thinking about is what size, ultimately, is your artwork going to end up? And if it's going to be on screen primarily, then you're thinking, you know, what is my computer screen resolution and what's the, you know, the size of the website? And if it's a book, is it traditional comic book size or am I going to do something square or am I going to do something small or something bigger? Um, I find that, you know, when you're younger, you don't know, you're not thinking about that stuff. So maybe you'll just start drawing. And then when you print a book, you're like, oh, wait, I actually want a book that's six by nine, but <laughs> I drew it all on eight and a half by 11 paper. Yeah. So um, it's now I have these like weird margins or something, but um, I think only artists care about that stuff. Uh, <laughs> I've certainly seen plenty of books, uh, like the the Avatar uh, Lost Adventures book that just came out, collected a bunch of stories that were all drawn at completely different sizes. Some of them were drawn like mini comics size for these DVD booklets. Some were done for the magazine, which was much more square, and then some were done sort of in between. And um, when I flip through the book, I'm like, oh my god, they're all different sizes. It looks so weird. Look at all these, you know, look at all this white space around the page. But you know, I. I was just flipping through it yesterday. Uh, you know, I was totally, totally just, uh, I left the conversation in the room and was just <laughs> flipping through this book and that didn't even come up. I was just so curious about the story and the artwork. And uh, I think, you know, I'm even an artist and I pay attention to those kind of things and it, it didn't even bother me. I think, I think it might oh, be. With the Avatar book specifically? With the Avatar book, yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, the big thing that jumps out the most is the lettering size changes a lot. Like the the ones that were drawn for mini comics, we had to do sort of like much bigger point size on the font. Mm -hmm. So when we blew the pages up, the lettering also got a lot bigger too. But again, I think only people really close to it notice that kind of stuff. Yeah. No, it was. Yeah, it was. It, it looked good. Uh, I liked thanks. it. Thanks. Um, so I work pretty similarly. Uh, to Jake, uh, I usually start with characters first. Like most of my stories, I, I was gonna I say, with, yeah, I start with character. Um, and I think with the Astronaut Academy, that's especially obvious. Yeah, because um, yeah. the whole book is really just about, um, you know, different characters playing off each other. So um, when I do presentations for kids, what I usually talk about is, you know, creating a character, um, figuring out who your protagonist is. Um, similarly to Jacob, like I think about like, okay, so what's the world that this character lives in? Um, but then the thing that I really get excited by is like, how do these characters play off each other? Um, so if you have a main character who is sort of a loner, you try to imagine like, you know, what's a good type of character to team them up with? Um, so in Astronaut Academy, uh, Mayumi is sort of like, you know, eccentric and she's very friendly and she's very happy. So she really contrasts uh, Hakata, who's really quiet and sullen and he's always looking down um, and she's always looking up. So next to each other, that they're, they're a good combo. And then you try to think, OK, so who's the antagonist, you know, to Maribel? And then you I mean, to Mayumi and you create this character, Maribel, who's like this sort of really snobby, rich girl. Um, and I just start sort of expanding outward uh, in that fashion, um, just thinking about how the characters will play off each other. And, and then I start thinking about dialogue and the scenes that, you know, how, if, if they were in this scenario together, how would they react? Um, so you just start creating uh, different things that could happen to them and, and, you know, and know that each character has to sort of respond differently. Um, so my stories tend to really be about the characters, um, at least with Astronaut Academy, um, with 
things like Agnes Quill, I'm I'm more sort of tapping into like uh, mystery and horror and genre. Um, and then usually I'm just thinking about things that are really cool to draw, um, <laughs> especially when I'm working with uh, another artist. Like if I'm writing something for somebody else to draw, I'm very cognizant of, you know, this is what these people are going to be spending a lot of time on the page doing. And I want it to be fun for them. And I want it to be something that they think, you know, is cool and fun and not just sort of like, oh, I got to draw the same thing over and over and over and over again. Um, right. You want to sort of vary it up and... Uh, I, I, I do tend to think in terms of almost like set pieces the way that like a movie has where it's like, okay, part of the story takes place here, part of the story takes place there um, and wanting to sort of vary that up. Um, I never yep. type up my script though. I never, uh, with, with Astronaut Academy, I never had to actually type anything up. I did everything uh, by hand and I tend to write in composition uh, notebooks. Oop, there's one upside down uh, like you have in school. And my first pass on writing is usually just like jotting ideas down when, it, when they come to me. Um, it's going to be really hard to see this stuff. But, I'll, but I literally will just have a book that sort of just says Astronaut Academy Book 2. And when I get an idea, I write it down. And it, if it makes sense, great. If it doesn't make sense, I'll look back at it and be like, oh, what did I mean by that? I'm not really sure. <laughs> um, but eventually time starts to run out and I have to start like cobbling together all these disconnected ideas and start putting them together. Um, hey, can so I just, I just say start... something, Dave? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point, too, for uh, creators out there or people who want to create. Um, to have one of those notebooks or to have a journal or something where when an idea comes into your head, you just go write it down and you don't have to hang on to it. Uh, you can you can leave room for other ideas to come into your head, but fill one of those things up. You know, I've got a, I've got a book here somewhere where I just kind of, you know, put those things down a little tiny moleskin yeah as i come up with them a moleskin or a you know here's a bigger book this is just my story journal and I, I think that's 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 huge because you get into this habit of creating ideas and 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 they come when they come and you don't have to sit down and be like oh now i have to create an idea you can just go to that book and be like oh here are my ideas yeah you're right because it'll happen at the weirdest times i one of my favorite stories i ever came up with happened while i was grocery shopping and I wasn't thinking about story, but then the first idea clicked, and then by the time I had finished grocery shopping, I had like seven things in the cart that I didn't intend on buying, like things I had no <laughs> use for at all. Like you know, it, was, it wasn't diapers, but it was something like that, you know. So, but 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 I had a finished story in my head, and I had no notebook on me to, to keep, you know, to, to jot it down in real quick. So I had yeah. to like recite it to myself the whole drive home, reciting all the ideas until I could run home, get to my no notebook, and get it on paper as fast as I could, because it will vanish, right? Yeah. Well, you should have bought a pen and a and a and a pad of paper in the uh, opposite <laughs> aisle. That would have, that would have demonstrated a little bit of foresight. Yeah, I should have quickly done that. You know, like people who like buy orange juice and then open up and drink it in the store. I'd be like buying yeah. office supplies and using them in the store. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, Dave, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Was, oh, nowadays, you can have like if you have an iPhone or That's like true. a smartphone. Um, there is like a notepad feature that you can write your ideas down in. So I use um, even just that's the that's voice. Uh, you can record your voice. Yeah, I've done that. <laughs> I'll just say, oh, here's an idea I thought of, and uh, I just want to, you know, and I, I, I rattle through it and then listen to it later and jot it down. Actually, yeah, I lean on Evernote a lot for that. I use Evernote extensively for where oh, I've got, cool. like, notes for each different project that I'm working on. If it's, an idea occurs to me for that, I can scroll to that project, tap it, quickly fire off the idea. But, yeah, it's not the same, though, as what Dave was showing us with that composition book because you're writing and drawing at the same time, which I think is an important thing to underscore that both of you guys do. I do it as well, is half the writing happens in doodles, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's usually how I brainstorm for ideas as well. I don't tend to brainstorm in text. I tend to brainstorm in doodles. And usually it's drawing something fun that gets me excited. I'm like, oh, this would be a great little scene or, oh, I should work this into a story. Um, that tends to be more the process than just staring at like a blank uh, computer screen or a typewriter or whatever. What about your um, thumbnailing process, Dave? Like, how do you start knitting these scenes together? When you were saying, like, when you're up against a deadline, you got to start cobbling the book together. I mean, what is the thought process in that? Or is this one of those things where it happens at the back of the brain? And this is when you get lost in that kind of inspiration place. Um, I do get lost, but then I will just start playing out scenes. Um, so. This is really, really, really rough. Um, but when I'm writing for myself, I don't even actually have to uh, complete the drawings. They're just sort of like half stick figures, half 
floating heads and sometimes I'll draw the scene and sometimes I won't. Sometimes it'll just be like speech bubbles. Um, because at that point, it's really just about thinking about it as a page because I'm trying to get a sense of how many pages is this book going to be? Um, mm -hmm. Because I'm not really good at creating an outline that I stick to. Um, some people can like write an outline and then be like, okay, this is exactly like this scene is going to be three pages and that scene is going to be four pages. Um, usually I have to sort of draw those pages out in some way, shape or form before I realize exactly how many pages they are. Um, because I tend to sort of get into a scene and then be like, oh, it would be funny to sort of add this extra little moment or this part should be a splash. And, and, and if I th sort of think that out in advance, um, usually like when I'm in, I kind of equate it to sort of like you can write a script, but then once you're on set with actors, you know, in an environment and you start playing around with that environment, you might get, you know, almost improv ideas and you'd be like, oh, what if we did this extra little thing? Or what if this character's reacting to the thing in the background that you didn't realize was going to be in the background when you wrote the script? But now that you've drawn it, you're like, oh, this is a really funny thing that could connect to somewhere else in the story. Um, but that's going to take me another two pages to sort of connect those two things. Um, so I try to have like a little bit of flexibility in what my final page count is going to be. When Again, this is all what I'm writing for myself. Uh, when I write for other people, I have to be a lot stricter and I have to try to, um, you know, because artists will, you know, get really angry, and editors will get even angrier. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, this might be a 50-page book, or it might be 500 pages. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, that, that's cool, though, that you 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 leave room open for for the happy accidents or or the the, the spur of the moment, you know, sort of ideas that come out. I like how you liken it to the to the film, you know, just doing things on set as opposed to to what what might be in the script. I think that's a lot of how, especially for me with comedy writing, like that's how the ideas come is you see something and then you start riffing off of it. Mm -hmm. um, so again, like if it's just text, you might have a, some visual in your head, but you're not going to have all the visuals in place. So you don't have all the ingredients to really make a tasty soup. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when you, do you thumbnail the same way though, Dave? Like, I mean, well, you just showed us some of your thumbs. Uh, so you thumb pretty big. Uh, yeah. Well, with book two, I've been a lot more organized. So now I've got this big stack of layouts where I actually oh. printed out a template um, of what the final size is supposed to be for the book. So this is the proportions. I created a sort of like gray line template, um, and now I'm actually sort of thumbnailing out the page again in a much more concrete way. Um, so that's so like 8.5 eight eight like, by 11 thumbnails. These are 8.5 by 11. So it's, <laughs> the size is manageable for me. I'm not doing the layouts full size. Uh, because when I, so when I draw the actual book, um, the actual pages are drawn on a Bristol board uh, this size, which is 11 by 14. OK. Uh, wow. So it's not exactly like what classic comic book uh, pages used to be. Right. Um, it's a little bit smaller. I'm I'm finding eleven by four. Enough. Yeah, eleven by fourteen is a great size for for comics pages. I'm finding better than eleven by seventeen, in my opinion. Yeah, it's, for me, it's perfect <laughs> because it's it's big enough that you're going to get all the detail and sort yeah. of be able to. Work it in, but it can fit into my backpack, which is really. Uh, um, have you Have you guys ever seen like an original pogo strip or uh, you know something by uh, you know one of the the old fifties <laughs> artists? Sure, Those yeah. things. Are huge. Yeah, I can't believe they drew so big. It's like a mural almost. Yeah, <laughs> and they did that every day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they're they're and they're beautiful. It's beautiful yeah. to look at. Yeah, they are beautiful. Um, and uh, I, I definitely got hung up on that, like growing up, because so part of like my transition from book one of Astronaut Academy to book two was that I used to write um, and do. I used to do all the lettering actually on the pages. Um, I don't think I have a, a sample of that. Um, but now, as I'm doing book two, I've kind of moved away from that. And now I'm, I created a font, and I'm like, I'm leaving the balloons blank and sort of doing that later. Uh, but with the first book, I did every single, every single word was actually written like on the page because I wanted the original art to be a finished product, and I wanted to, you know, yeah. uh, because you know sometimes Jersey calls you up and says, hey, we were doing this art museum thing in Ann Arbor, let's. Uh, <laughs> Let's or in Chelsea, and let's uh, let's hang up your artwork, and it, you want it to actually look good and be readable. Um, yeah. Right. But with book two, just to hit my deadline, I've just had to move away from that. Now I'm viewing every page as just sort of like, you know, it's just process. It's just whatever it takes to get to that final 
book. That's how I look yeah. at it too. So yeah, all of my original art with lettering on it is from like 2001. That's like the last <laughs> time I hand lettered a page, you know. Um, well, I was lettering with uh, with these uh, Crow Quill Hunt 107. Uh, no way. Pens, wow. And they've they've stopped making the nib for one thing. Like now, it's like you have to buy them on eBay or like really track down like a really, you know. Black market dealer that sells. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, want to buy a pen? Yeah, that's yeah. totally what I was I thinking of. That Sesame Street basement. character. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but these things were dangerous. I was actually uh, telling someone recently how if you're if you're like me and you have like a really sort of like heavy hand and you're really pushing down to do these sort of like fine letters, the metal would shatter a lot. So you're oh, like wow. writing a letter and then it would go. Ping! And like little shards of metal would go flying, and luckily I wear glasses because a lot of times they would like you know hit you in hit there. right to my. They would yeah, I'd be blind if I uh, wear I'd, protective I'd, eye gear while using this well, pen. Well, you, yeah, <laughs> I've had that happen with a couple of Hunts 102 Crow Quills too. Uh, yeah, well, this, this is a 107, so they're yeah. pretty much they're they're pretty similar they're size. They're brothers. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, hey, Dave, I'm getting a little slap back from you for some reason, and uh, I think it might be, yeah, it, my, my voice is bouncing from the speakers to the mic, and it might be bouncing off your chest. You can lean back a little. Oh, 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 oh. and then I think we, oh, he's still there. I thought we were going to lose Dave for a second there. I actually have, both of you guys are frozen, but I can hear you guys fine, so. I think I think Dave dropped out. His his internet oh. is is spotty, and this happens every time he's on the show. So it wouldn't be a comics are great with Dave if he didn't disappear for a little while. <laughs> so he'll he'll be back. Oh, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> he'll be back in the second half of the show, everybody. Let's hear it for Dave. All right. <laughs> and that's how you make comics. <laughs> <laughs> he's done. He just walked away. Um, I, I, Interesting that, you know, you talk about starting with the world. Dave talked about starting with characters. And uh -huh. I always start with, I, I usually start with like a character idea, general premise idea. But the, the first place where I spend the, the majority of my time investment in uh, making comics is in the, the theme, the aboutness. What am I trying to say through this story? Like that's the first thing I really sweat when I'm trying to suss out a story. So, and, and the reason why is just because I want every character's action in the story to, and I use it as like a, what do I want to say? Um, sort of like a, an intellectual framework. It's not like I'm trying yeah. to indoctrinate people. It's just like this is the way that I can organize my ideas is by asking what is the central focus of my story. And then I can right. sort of figure out by holding up all of the different pieces that I may want to use. Um, I can figure out, oh, that doesn't re directly refer to what was being expressed in the theme, and I can throw it out. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes total sense. And it's like if, if, if the story's ever getting squishy, you can always go back, okay, here's my theme, uh, uh -huh. and, and how is this uh, uh, reiterating the theme, or how is it you know, stepping away from that? I, or, I, I think that's a great way to keep yourself on course. Yeah, that's, that's really how I use it. I just use it as a, as a directional tool, a compass in my storytelling. Because uh -huh. I remember writing a scene where two of my characters went into this long... Uh, sort of navel gazing conversation, and it it didn't feel right. It didn't feel right for some reason for these characters to be expressing that much of their personal angst in the story. And then I stopped. I backed up, looked at the thing. Well, this is what the story is about. Does this refer to that? No. It's really this is a self indulgent little thing for my characters to feel sorry for themselves. It can go. You know, yeah. it, it, it becomes a great editing tool, at least for me. So, yeah, that's be, cool. So that I, for me, it goes theme first, then characters, premise, and then you know, really fleshing out the world. But yeah, I I don't do as detailed of outlines as you do, but I do do a similar thing where I write a, ba a basic paragraph, this is what the story is about, this is the essential actions that need to happen in this story, and then I break it into chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, here are the essential actions that happen in each of these chapters. Yeah. Uh, and then I build out from there to thumbnails. Well, I think this is great. I mean, here's three different approaches, and I think you can go read each of our books and, and see the strength and the weakness to, to going about it that way. Because I know people have said to me, oh, I love this world that you've created. Your yeah. characters are a little stiff, but uh, th this is really, you know, this is, I feel like I'm in, in his world, right? It's really thought out. And I'm sure, you know, uh, the opposite could be said for, 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 for Dave's stuff, where, you know, these it's all about the character. And I, I, I've actually, I'm sitting here listening to both of you, learned a lot as far as things I need to focus on more <laughs> <laughs> as I make comics. 
Uh, well, that, that, that's the whole fun of talking about this stuff is it is nerdy and it's not always necessarily interesting to a non-practitioner, but uh, <laughs> it, it is great for self-reflection too. I mean, it's just fun to talk about this stuff. But, you know, what's also interesting is you're talking about doing maps and, you know, charts and, and cutaways of things. I do that with my sets, like with the sets where I know I'm going to be spending a lot of time in my world where, because blocking is super important to me. Like, I want people to understand where the characters are in relation to one another in my stories. So, like, if here's an apartment where I'll, there's going to be at least four scenes in this apartment i'll do an actual floor plan of the apartment do you oh, do that's that? great do yeah. you do that dave uh i've done it with a little i've done it a little bit um but i've found depending on the type of book you're doing with astronaut academy i've kind of keep going back and forth between how much how specific i want that world to be um because i also think that there's something to be said for creating an abstract universe that is really where the author is giving you just enough for then the reader to fill in the rest of the blanks and really to connect it with themselves. Like, I kind of want the reader to be imagining, you know, or sort of putting their own spin on where right. Astronaut Academy... Wait, can you hear me? Are you? Yeah, no, we can hear you. Jake's, I think Jake's talking to his family. I oh. have a kid that wants to <laughs> come in. <laughs> <laughs> Does she want to say hi? Uh, hey, Miles. Oh, he... It's a he. Come here. <laughs> it's a he. <laughs> Say hi. Say hi. Hey, Miles. <laughs> you're, at, you're, shy now. you're on the okay. TV. Okay, go out. I'll be with you in a minute, okay? <laughs> yeah, we're wrapping up here in a second. <laughs> but, but what you said, Dave, goes back to something you said in our talk about Harry Potter versus Chronicles of Narnia, is this idea of what you, one of the things that you gravitated towards in uh, Harry po uh, the Harry Potter series was that there was just enough, but there was blanks to be filled in by the fans, right? Is that what you're responding to, do you think? Yeah, um, but I also connected just to comics in general, just yeah. the, you know, the, the sort of Scott McCloud theory of you know, less is more sometimes where, you know, the more detailed a face is drawn, the less you can connect with that face. And the mm -hmm. more simple it is, the more you sort of put yourself into it. Um, and how comics is about, you know, what's between the panels as much as it is about what's actually in those panels. So I wanted Astronaut Academy to be this world where, you know, you're imagining yourself there and you're sort of putting your own take on it. It's not completely like, oh, this is what exactly what the walls look like. This is exactly what the floor looks like. Um, I did a little bit of that. And certainly from the book to the, the original comic strip, I, I, I got a little bit more detailed. Um, but it's usually in the beginning. Like, I just want to sort of set it up and sort of it's like I'm giving it to the reader to then go off and, and put themselves in that world. Um, but then conversely... But, conver but that's, very, that's very specific to that project well that that and that's also informed by author voice author intent author taste and then and then also audience taste because then you can turn to jake and look at the, the world of missile mouse where it's like the, what, what excited me about that is like as a kid is this is a ready-made world for me to step into and start role-playing into you know like one of the things that i think is a real value in writing uh, in fiction for young people is giving them a jumping off point to role play in that world like one of the things i think like when i talk about like gi joe a real american hero and i get all nerdy and you know analytical about what made that so effective besides the fact that it was the 80s and we were all consumers <laughs> um is this idea that each character the characters are not rich in gi joe at all they are very two-dimensional this is gung-ho he's very big and boisterous this is roadblock he's very strong and he rhymes a lot this is duke he hates cobra and that's all he thinks about you know but the world was very well developed and really really terrific terrific illustrations of the Cobra temples and the G.I. Joe headquarters. So the world was ready made. The characters are two dimensional to a degree, but they were just enough to make you go, I wonder what it'd be like if I was in that world and what would Duke say if I did this? I can anticipate that because he's so clear as a character. He's so, you know, ready written for me. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, I sort of equate that to the fact that when I was a kid, I didn't like to read the sort of bio cards on the back of the action figures. Um, <laughs> So I'd get a G.I. Joe character, and I would see what they looked like and be like, oh, this is a really cool design. And on the back of the packaging, it would tell you exactly who they were, and I didn't want to know. Oh, I man. Wanted to, I wanted to just sort of be like, okay, I get from his costume that he's kind of evil. I get that he's, got <laughs> you know, he's hiding behind a mask. He's got this extra little belt. What's in that belt? 
Um, I didn't want someone to tell me what are you know what what's in his pouches. I want to be the one to sort of figure it out. We um, so but I was wouldn't. Also someone, but I was also someone who never played GI Joe like straight up. Like I'd always mix the GI Joe with the Transformers and the mask. Who were like you know mask guys were like hobbits because they're short. <laughs> oh god. Uh, oh god. So, and like He-Man were giants, you know, like they were like a bigger race of people. So I was like creating this amalgam universe of all my toys, uh, we rather so, than sort of playing the way that they were designed to be played. We would not have been friends when we were kids, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I would have walked out of the sandbox like a diva. We're, I'm out of here. No, that's not how you play G.I. Joe. <laughs> no, I totally did the same thing. I mixed my Star Wars toys. The, the, I had an ad at, and that was I made it a Cobra vehicle called the Cobra Cathedral because it was so big, you know. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> the Cobra Cathedral. <laughs> that's hilarious. No, I, I yeah, I, I was sort of the the guy that wanted to just you know like go to the Star Wars universe when they started to come out with those. Uh, incredible cross-section books and the, the, the visual dictionary books, I just ate that up because I would see a character in the background and it excited me to know that in this Star Wars universe, like he has an entire backstory that I can go find out and, and see what, you know, see what it is. And, uh, but I, there's, I could, you know, looking back, I think there's merit though to, to not knowing that stuff and just creating it yourself. Like that's, that's really interesting, but I, I've never really been that guy. Yeah, yeah I, just, I, I, I mean, I enjoy stuff that's really detailed as well. Um, but I think, it, like I said, it, it really is depending on the on the project. And um, I sort of equate it to things like Lost, where um, the first season of Lost, like everybody loves the first season of Lost because it's all open. Everything is sort of like hints at this world and there's this smoke monster and there's things going on, on this island and there's all this stuff happening off camera. So as a, as, a, as a reader or as a viewer, you are sort of filling in the blanks. And a lot of times I think that the reader can make that cooler than the author can. Um, yeah. I think that often what ends up happening, uh, so many people are always disappointed with finales on things because they don't like the way that things are resolved. They don't like the way things are wrapped up. They don't like the way that things are ultimately explained because our own imaginations are more powerful than the collective, you know, like than one author can uh, yeah, and that's not to to put down those authors or to put down uh, you know the writers of these shows. No, I just think that you know our imaginations are so powerful, and I always yeah. get really disappointed when like something like Avatar: The Last Airbender. Uh, so many people say, "Oh, they never explain what happened to Zuko's mom. They never have explain what happened to Zuko's mom. It's unresolved." And to me, it's like so much more powerful because it's not resolved because yeah. they left that open. You can sort of fill in those blanks and. You know, I don't want to know. I'd rather I, I can kind of guess, and I think that that's more. I think it's, like that's a sort of fun way to write stories. Is yeah, to sort I, of write I, intentionally to that. I think you're right, and uh, and I and and I think that's why the prequels were such a downer for the Star Wars fans. Oh, is yeah, because absolutely. I mean, you you heard you you kind of knew there was this past between Obi Wan and Darth Vader, and and maybe you read somewhere that there was this you know battle uh, you know on a lava planet. Uh, and or then, even just the things they throw out. It's like, oh, you know, I fought with him in the Clone Wars. And yeah. it's like, oh, what are the Clone Wars? Wow. Yeah. And now it's like, oh, now I know exactly what the Clone Wars yeah. are. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to give you guys a chance to collect a final thought on this discussion because we're going to bring in Eli Nyberger here in just a second. And, All right. and I want, uh, and also if you have any uh, comics picks that you want to share with anybody this week, any kind of book recommendations. Um, so, but I, I do want to th throw in this thought that a, a teaching friend of mine once said to me that I thought was really interesting. She said, like, uh, you know, there's more going on in our heads when we're reading than we think. And even people who say that they don't have a visual imagination, they do, because uh, when, if you've ever gone to a movie that's been based on a book and you say, oh, I wouldn't pick that character, that actor to play that character, and they say, well, who would you pick? And they're like, I don't know, but not that guy. We mm -hmm. clearly have an image in our head, and we're doing a lot more imagining when we're enjoying a story than we think we do, even if, like I said, like, even if you think you're a non-creative person. Uh, and that, and that, that's a good example of that, is like what you're talking about with the Clone Wars, what you're talking about with the end of uh, Avatar, The Last Airbender, and then also that example with the movie. So... Okay, we've got Eli Nyberger here. Let's see if I can turn the monitor so they can actually see you a little bit. How about that? How's it going, guys? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. So, uh, Eli Nyberger of the Ann Arbor District Library, what do you got for us today that you want to share? Well, as I just far brought in a couple things uh, from the collection just to kind of like, you know. Uh, now, uh, just kind of what I've been reading and a couple things that are brand new. Now, one thing, and uh, I think a lot of 
everyone's probably familiar with this, which is Jeff, Sm Jeff Smith's new book, Rassel. Uh, and this is volume two, volume three just came out. But you know, I know that, uh, I know that in the comics crowd, uh, not everybody is comfortable with the uh, amazing achievements of Jeff Smith commercially. Um, <laughs> and it's a little daunting to look at his stuff with an open mind, but man, this is so great. I don't know if you guys have, have read this yet. I've flipped through it. Yeah. I have not read it yet. It's just fantastic. And it's really, it's the anti-bone uh, with... <laughs> with the same lettering. So it's like, you feel like everyone's got the same voices. And, you know, it's very, it's like, we're smiley. We're missing smiley in this equation. But it's very hard science fiction, very gritty, dark kind of stuff. It's about parallel universes, a lot about Tesla. It's got the, the, the Philadelphia experiment, all that kind of stuff. And it's just, it's very cool to see when a creator has kind of hit the pinnacle of, of you know, commercial success with something, with a self-published project, to then be able and, and turn around and, you know, do a project like this, which is just s clearly what he's really into. The bibliography at the end of uh, the books about Tesla, and he's reading stuff by Michio Kaku and Secrets of the Unified Field, and he's just recommending all these books. So he's very clearly trying to do a lot of research. So I just wanted to oh, cool. throw that out there because I've been reading it, and I think it's fantastic. The other is, I just brought this in. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Michael Kupperman. Um, this oh, is God. Tales Designed to Thrizzle. He's a creator of Snake and Bacon. <laughs> and uh, this is like such a love letter to like 60s and 70s comics. I mean, with the ads and everything. And it's just, let me see if I can find a good example here. Um, <laughs> yeah, like what's in your glass of water? And, uh, you know, it's 4% bread and 7% <laughs> Olmec head gribble. And uh, <laughs> tiny businessmen, 3.2%. Here's Indian spirit chewing gum haunted with real dead Indian flavor. Uh, it's just wow. so much hilarious stuff in here. And uh, what's interesting about this, you know, he's got... Uh, Adult Swim has been playing around with a snake and bacon show, and I think it finally wound up going online, that mm. they did not put it into the, the actual uh, TV lineup. But man, it's like, if you ever read comics and kind of lingered over the ads, it's like, this is just one of the most hilarious books. But then what I really want to show, especially for your audience, is uh, one thing that I just found on the new book cart downstairs. And this is Richard Williams. I'll show it to, show it to you guys, and then uh, the other camera. Uh, <laughs> this is... Uh, this is, uh, Richard Williams was the director of animation on Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and this is his expanded animator survival kit, which is, you know, it's, of course, it's a lot about animation, but it's got so much great tips about motion and getting things looking dynamic, and he does just tons of stuff with, you know, how to get the timing right, and it's a lot of it is in comic form, and there's a lot of just really outstanding illustrations in here. What I love most about it is like most of his animations, you can see that he's got one of those four color big pens, you know, with the blue, red, and the green, and the black, <laughs> because awesome. almost all of his uh, almost all of his stuff is like those four colors, and you can even see the pen work and all that stuff. So it's very much, you know, sort of about tr making the transition to being an animator, but he's got some really very cool stories in here, some war stories from Making Roger Rabbit, which, you know, when you think about the technology that they had then, for compositing yeah. and, and stuff like that. I mean, it's like everything was hand done that now, you know, is two clicks away on your phone. Yeah, you, know, you can yeah. do that kind of stuff. <laughs> so so those are those are just some things out of the collection I thought I'd grab and, and bring in. Speaking bring of Roger here. Rabbit and the compositing that they do, um, how come that worked so well 20 years ago, yet when we make the Smurfs today, we have to make the Smurfs look real? <laughs> you know, I think that part of that is, is that... Uh, I think that they would have been as bad in the in the in the nineties if they had had the technology to try it. I mean, because they spent a lot of money on Roger Rabbit trying to make it as realistic as possible. Mm -hmm. And you know, some of the commentary tracks and stuff, some of the stuff they talk about is like, you know, uh, I know what's uh, Bob Hoskins says. You know, if I pointed like this, it was a five thousand dollars shot, and if I pointed like this, it was a twenty thousand dollars shot because they had to mask around every wow. one of his fingers and every one of the frames and all that stuff. Wow. But uh, I think that the you know, the, the whole 3D films are being so, uh, making so much noise at the box office right now. And, you know, I mean, it's like there was a really interesting article I read this week. I don't remember where it was. I think it might have been on Boing Boing about how CG has basically climbed all the mountains of filmmaking that we've had now with the Harry Potter series, a completely amazing fantasy wizard magic thing. Okay, that's done. Alien World, av Avatar, Jim Cameron's Avatar did the alien world thing. And it's like all these sort of Mount Everests of filmmaking have fallen by the wayside. And people are still like, okay, what you got now? 
Uh, you know, and it's like there's this real uh, challenge, I think, for the filmmakers um, to be able to make interesting work within a system that is not that doesn't take risks. You mm-hmm. know, and it's it's just part of another one of those we as we've been talking about on other uh, podcasts. Um, you know, is the huge project the the sort of multi million or billion dollar project where's the future of that and how does the audience of those compare to the independent creators and you know people who are just making their own stuff and building their own audience yeah so i think that uh yeah the smurfs is definitely a travesty against mankind but i think <laughs> that there's you know <laughs> and it's just it's like it's like well it's I think the uncanny valley is going to become something that's in a lot more common parlance. You know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. And I think that it's just like, man, the Smurfs are like right. It's like they built their little houses right at the bottom of the uncanny valley. <laughs> they did. You know, they and did. it's like, man, this is just. Jer- yeah. mm-hmm. Jersey, did I ever tell you how my dream Smurf movie? No. Would be, would be to do like a straight up Lord of the Rings style epic fantasy that just happens <laughs> to have the Smurfs in it. Right. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> would they still talk in Smurf though? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. The Smurfs would be what they are, right. but it's, it's just, it's, it's not unlike, you know, you're really doing like a, a Johan and a Pee Wee movie. Right. Like, you know, these two guys <laughs> oh, on the wow. quest, and they run into the Smurfs on their adventure, and the Smurfs are part of their event, uh, a part of their adventure, but do it like, you know, straight, like rather than taking it to New York and doing the yeah. whole thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that would be cool. And the Smurfs are 2D animated. And everything is film, right? <laughs> or even, <laughs> or or even just render it like Pixar quality. No, just, it should just be live action, you know. Just get the Blue Man Group guys involved, <laughs> and, and you know. Yeah. Oh my god. The funniest would be like the lines of that drama, David. Be like, uh, you know, you must Smurf the Smurf into the heart of Mount Smurf, or or our people are Smurfed. <laughs> <laughs> and it's especially you know delivered with all of the kind of gravitas of right. uh, of an Aragorn from the Lord of right. the Rings. Yeah, <laughs> you gotta get McKellen to voice. Yeah. You Smurf. shall not smurf. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> oh uh, my gosh! Oh, yeah, and you, get, you get that guy who played Batman. That guy who had that meltdown. What's his name? Uh, oh, Christian Bale. Christian Bale. Yeah. Yes. 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 Get your Smurf and Smurf out of my Smurf and shot. <laughs> Smurf you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, All right. Well, this was a super, super fun episode for me. I hope I can get Dave and uh, Jake back again for this because we got to dig deeper into this stuff. We only kind of skimmed across the top of the pond. Yeah, so, thanks for having us. Um, hey, any things that you guys want to shout out about events that you're uh, – signings, appearances, classes that you're doing? Um, sh- go for it, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be at a store called One More Page Books – uh, August 10th, and that's in Virginia. It's called One More Page Books. And then the next thing for me is Small Press Expo in September, which is September 9th in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, Fun. That's the next place is to see me. Um, if I can, I'd also like to, if, uh, if, are we doing book plugs? Are we doing... Oh, yeah, uh, you can mention a book plug. Go for it. Um, I would like to plug a book that's in the works called School of Worlds. Um, it is by two artists named Rel and Megan. Uh, Megan Brennan was my other art assistant. Uh, we had Gail Williams on here a couple weeks ago. Uh, Megan Brennan is a SVA grad uh, who I think is going to be huge in the world of comics uh, very, very soon. And she's doing this great book called School of World, uh, which is an interactive comic that happens on Tumblr where people like write a question to the character, and then she basically creates. They create comics based on the questions that the readers are asking them. Oh, cool. super cool. Uh, so she's got a Kickstarter up where she's raising money to do a book version in time for SBX. Cool. So should be awesome. That'll be in the show notes. Uh, you don't have the actual uh, or the Tumblr URL right on you, do you? That we can uh, say on the show? It's, it's schoolofworld.tumblr.com. Okay. Awesome. And we'll link to it in the show notes so people can find it. Uh, Jake? And I will be in my office for the next <laughs> few weeks, uh, at which point I will leave the office and go to school where I teach. Uh, <laughs> no, I guess if you're enrolled at BYU uh, and you're watching this, I'd love to have you in my class. I'm teaching character design. I'm teaching um, uh, what's another concept art, and then I teach a Photoshop class. So look, look for my name. And uh, uh, my book, Awesome Man, comes out next month in September so check that out 
And you can always find me at mrjakeparker.com. Mr. Jake Parker to you, yes. yes. <laughs> Recently, you went through a bit of an agonizing process trying to find a, a good Twitter handle, but Mr. Yes. Jake Parker on the Twitters. And Dave is yay time on the Twitters. Eli is Eulotricus. 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 Yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Showing what, what a goy I am sometimes. <laughs> I'm fairly certain that's not Yiddish, but that's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, uh, Eulotricus on yeah. Twitter. Uh, and uh, then, oh, the other thing I need to make some noise about is August 16th and 17th, computer coloring classes at the Ann Arbor District Library, downtown branch. Uh, seating is limited. Uh, registration is now open at AADL.org. I'm going to be teaching a course on how to color comics and do digital cleanup in Adobe Photoshop Elements. So you don't even need to get the big fancy Photoshop suite. You can get a nice cheap version. It actually comes installed with uh, most graphics tablets. So nice. uh, $80 program, you know, you can get it off and running and, and do actually professional computer coloring. And I'll show you how. August 16th and 17th, two sessions each day. Go to AADL.org to sign up. So. Thank you, Dave, of yaytime.com. Thank you, Jake, of agent44.com. Thanks, Eli, of aadl.org. Thank you, Tristan. Um, anything you want to shout out about Summer Game before I go? No, I think, we're, you know, Summer Game's coming up to a big close. We got, uh, it'll end August 26th, and we have something very special lined up for the week following it. So okay. any of your listeners that are playing the Summer Game, stay tuned. Okay, cool. All right, well, All right. Uh, until next time, everybody, I've been Jersey Drozd of comicsagreat.com, Jersey on the Twitters. Thanks for listening. Thanks for downloading. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.